the standard form of a second order linear equation looks something like this. So there are going to be some functions here, p and q, and we're going to assume that these functions are continuous on an interval, we'll call it a to b. Now, why do we want to study this? Well, a second order differential equation is a model for a lot of things that come up in physics, engineering, etc. It's a model for a mass spring system or a shock absorber. So, for instance, you could have a mass hanging from a spring and then it bounces and sets into motion. It's also a model for an RLC circuit. So if you've got a circuit with a battery, an inductor, capacitor, and resistor, then the charge, Q of T, satisfies a second order differential equation like this. Now as a very simple introductory example to at least put us in the right ballpark, here is a second order linear DE. Right. Now, what we're asking is, I've got to find some sort of solution, some sort of function y of t that's going to make the second derivative add up with the first derivative, add up with the function itself to give me zero. So what kinds of functions might do that? Well, we could take a guess knowing what we know about derivatives and functions, and things like exponentials are when you differentiate them, they just be become themselves again. Uh, things like sine and cosine will work. So we're going to try out an exponential. And what I mean by that is, let's say we're going to assume that we're going to guess that the solution should look something like this, e to the lambda t, so that when I differentiate it, I'll get lambda e to the lambda t. And when I take the second derivative, I just use the chain rule again and I get all of this stuff. So if I were to take all of this information and plug it into that differential equation, here's what I'll get. I'll end up with a lambda squared e to the lambda t, subtract lambda e to the lambda t, subtract 2 e to the lambda t, and I would like to know if that's 0. Well, there's a common factor of e to the lambda t, so what I'm left with is something like this. Now I know that this exponential function will never be zero, so that means this choice of function will only be an answer if I can satisfy this equation with the lambda. So that means that I'll get lambda minus two, lambda plus one gives me zero. So this will produce answers only for these two values of lambda. And that means that my solutions should be e to the 2t and e to the minus t. And if you wanted to, you, you, know, you could check this out, right? You could take the derivative of 2t, y prime is 2e to the 2t, y double prime is 4e to the 2t. If you plug that into the de, you'll get 4e to the 2t, subtract 2e to the 2t, subtract 2 e to the 2t, and yes, it does give me zero like I expect it to. So there's some questions that come up here. If I say e to the 2t and e to the minus t are solutions, are there other solutions? Right? Did I, I just guessed. Are there any other ones? Like, did I miss something? I would like to know. So what we have to do is study this kind of differential equation and try to figure out if we missed anything. And we are going to study it by using a lot of facts from calculus and facts from linear algebra. So the first result here is what is referred to as theorem 2.1.1. It's in the textbook as theorem 211 and on the sheet that I've attached. Basically, it says, look, if y1, y2 solve this differential equation, then this linear combination is also a solution. So here's what I mean by that. 
if y1 is a solution, that means any time you put y1 into the differential equation, it's going to add up to zero. And if y2 is a solution, that means any time you put y2 into the differential equation, it's going to add up to zero. From calculus, if I ever decide that I would like to take the derivative of a sum, I know that's the sum of derivatives. If I want to take the derivative of a multiple, I know that it becomes the multiple of the derivatives. So I know that from calculus, I will end up with this. And I know that if I were to take the second derivative of that thing, that the same sort of result pops out. That's called linearity. And linearity is a really useful property. It's what we're going to do is we are going to sub c1y1 plus c2y2 into the differential equation left-hand side because I want to see what it gives me. All right, so if I put this in to the de on the left-hand side, I take the second derivative, I multiply this by p of t, and then I multiply the function itself by q of t. A lot of writing here, but you get the idea. We're going to get c1 y1 double prime, c2 y2 double prime, p times c1 y1 prime, c2 y2 prime, and q c1 y1 plus c2 y2. I can then reorganize this. I can group everything that has a y1. I can put them all together and I'll get c1 y1 double prime, p y1 prime, q y1. And to that, I can add everything that has a y2. So all of these terms with y2s, I can group together and there's a common factor and just like in the other case, those are all going to be factored together like this. And now the key moment is because y1 is a solution, that's zero. And because y2 is a solution, that's zero. And so what that means is if I plug this quantity into the differential equation and it gives me a zero, that means any linear combination of solutions also solves the differential equation. So that's really useful. We are going to make a very key rewrite for our differential equation. The DE we've got is y double prime plus py prime qy is zero. I'm going to use this notation where if I have a derivative, I'm just going to call it a capital D. And if I have a second derivative, I'll call it a D squared. And I'm going to write this differential equation kind of like this. And what that allows me to do is to think of this differential equation as some, I'll call it, operations acting on y and then they produce zero. Now the key thing here is that these are all linear operations. And because they're all linear operations, I'm just going to call this thing L. And I'm going to call this L for linear. And that means that our differential equation becomes ly equals zero. So it's a very succinct, compact way of writing it, but it's more than just compactness. I'm not doing this just to save some space when I write. It's supposed to make you think of something. You're supposed to look at this and say, hold, hold on, this looks like ax equals zero from linear algebra. 
And now here's the big idea. To find all of the solutions to Ly equals 0, we are going to think of it like finding the solutions to Ax equals 0. And what I mean by that is, if I'm looking for the solutions to Ax equals 0, that means I'm trying to find what's called a basis for the null space. And the key thing here is that I'm looking for a basis. And remember that a basis is a set of solutions to this problem that are, number one, linearly independent, and number two, span the solution set. What it means is, if I find a handful of vectors that are the right ones, I can create every other solution from these. And then we say that the general solution would be C1, X1, plus C2, X2, all the way down the list. Well, that's the same thing that we are trying to do here. I have a differential equation, Ly equals 0, and I would like to try to find a basis. We don't call it a null space when we don't when we have a when we don't have a matrix like this it's technically called a kernel but you can think of it as a null space and that means what we need to do is find a set of solutions that are number 1 linearly independent and number 2 span the solution set and the point is we were trying to find a general solution that's going to look like a linear combination of some of these other functions. That's what we're trying to get at. And from these basis solutions, we will be able to form every other solution. 